Thank you for joining us, yes. So next up, we have a, a dear friend of mine, uh, Rebecca. Um, Rebecca Harper, she's uh, been making a name for herself in uh, UX strategy uh, uh, design space since uh, 2011. And uh, Rebecca got curious about non-traditional uh, library career, um, careers and joined the BC government's UX design team, um, where she, uh, her passion for information architecture, content strategy, and end-to-end -end service strategy and design was ignited. So yeah, she was recently um, uh, for the last two years in, uh, in Australia. And uh, she uh, was working at the University of Queensland. Uh, she's back in Canada again, and she's eager to share with you uh, the inherent need for curiosity. Uh, Rebecca, Rebecca joins us, I, I think, from Medicine Hat, Alberta. And uh, let's welcome uh, Rebecca in the, Harper in the chat. Oh, hi. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. That's fantastic. I'm seeing all my setting is all set up so you can see my screen and all that good stuff. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Andrew, for that introduction. It is great to be with all of you today on one of my favorite days of the year. Um, interestingly enough, the very first um, World IA day that I went to was in Edmonton, uh, and I met some absolutely incredible people who have continued to be um, critical in my career and um, just really great people that I've enjoyed being friends with, never mind co-workers with. So uh, thank you so much for, for having me. Um, like Andrew said, um, I am recently back from Australia. I spent two wonderful sunny years living by the beach and hanging out and uh, learned a lot in, the, in those two years about curiosity and, and how curiosity is an important part of, of our, our careers and our, and our jobs. So without further ado, um, how moving around the world twice welcomed and necessitated curiosity. So um, kind of coming back, I think it's full circle to what Aldrich was talking about towards the end of his chat is these kids that ask why. Um, I spent the other day with my three nieces and nephews here in Medicine Hat. Uh, they are six, three, and one. And I heard the word why more times than I can count. I think I need to get some question cards like Aldrich's mom did. Um, so, you know, a, I think there's a lot to be learned though from these kids that ask why, 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 um, it can be exhausting for us adults. But, you know, I think that, that it, it speaks a lot to kind of how those kids are making sense of their world, um, you know, and, and why that stops and, and why we stop asking why as adults, um, you know, why do we stop asking, you know, is it because we're risk averse? Is it because we're just comfortable with the status quo, you know, overwhelmed and overworked uh, with our day-to-day -day responsibilities? The idea of even like branching out and asking why there just simply isn't time. Uh, are we just uncertain of, of where to start? Uh, I think for a lot of us, it comes down to that kind of self-consciousness. And, you know, if I ask why, it indicates that maybe I don't know everything and I'm expected to be the expert. And so if I don't know everything, what does that say about me as a professional? You know, there's a lot of different layers that, that kind of comes with why we don't ask why anymore. Um, so, you know, how can we kickstart that curiosity and, and incorporate it into our everyday lives um, and, our, and our work as UX designers? Um, you know, there's some really brilliant work being done by social scientists around the world. Um, that dedicate their entire lives to understanding this. So I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in their field of study, but I, I want to share with you the experience that I had in moving halfway around the world and back again in the span of two years that really kind of challenged me and stretched me and, and drove me to ask why uh, one more time. So a little bit about my background, and Andrew certainly talked a little bit about it uh, in, in his introduction of me. Um, so, you know, my journey into the world of, of UX and information architecture is a lot like my journey to and from Australia. 
It's been complex. It's been highly rewarding. There have been days where I've wondered if it's at all worth it, um, you know, but it, along the way, it's been full of all sorts of surprises. And, uh, you know, it's led me to a really great place right now. So um, I graduated from the University of British Columbia in 2011. I had studied library and information studies, thinking I was going to work in one of my absolute most favorite places in the whole world, a library. I grew up with a mom who encouraged reading and literacy and most of my childhood memories are in some way tied to my local public library. Most of my early employment was tied to my local public library. Um, and so I, I went to school thinking, yeah, I'm gonna be a librarian. I'm gonna have a great impact on some other children, just like my librarians had a really positive impact on my life. And then I graduated and the world was still reeling from the, the global financial crisis and libraries funding was being cut and there was, little to no job security in that field. And so I started getting a little bit curious about what I could do with this degree that I had worked so hard for and that I had amassed some debt for that I desperately wanted to pay off. Um, and this idea of user experience design kind of floated across my desk and, and I started asking why and you know how, how can I get involved in this? So um, I was, I was connected with the uh, user experience design team within the government of British Columbia. Um, I happened to be living in Victoria at the time and it's a pretty small community. Um, and, and the two people who uh, were leading the team at the time who are actually now in Edmonton leading a very similar um, design team in, in the Alberta government, both said, hey, you've got a really great skill set with all of your library and information studies background. Why don't you come join our team? And so I did that. Um, until about 2014, I, I lived in Victoria. We did a lot of work with the, the BC government in a variety of different departments, helping to implement um, their, their kind of government 2.0 vision of a more user-centric uh, website for uh, citizens of British Columbia. And then I decided in 2014 to come to the wonderful land of Alberta again. I had been born and raised here um, and it was a, a bit of a homecoming. And so I, I tied that in with the launch of my own UX design consultancy in Calgary. I practiced in Calgary for four years and met some absolutely incredible people, both through the Calgary UX community, as well as through some of the clients I work with. I've done a lot of work with the city of Calgary and um, Critical Mass and a couple other um, Alberta-based organizations. And then a really great opportunity came for me to move to Australia. Um, and so I thought, you know what? The snow is ridiculous. I hate winter. Well, let's give it a try and see, see what else is out there. So I moved down to Australia in February of 2019 and started working with the University of Queensland as their information architect on a massive digital transformation project that is underway and will likely take well over a decade to fully achieve. Um, I spent about almost two years there and this November I, uh, I came home. I came back to my, my hometown of Medicine Hat, uh, which I never thought I would be able to live in again just because there's not a lot of UX design work that happens in the city here. It's, it's small enough that there isn't really a lot of large industry to, to warrant setting up my own shop here. But thanks to COVID um, and, and the wonderful world of remote working, I've, um, I've been working from my home here in Medicine Hat for some clients um, across Alberta as well as across North America. So um, it's, been, it's been a pretty great few months here. So when I kind of think about what was going through my head as I was getting ready to move to Australia, I have to admit, I wasn't really all that curious. I thought I kind of knew what Australia was going to be. I thought there was going to be spiders, lots of spiders and snakes too. Um, I thought it would be a lot like Canada, uh, you know, similar government structure, kind of similar foundations of how the country came to be, still speaking English, you know, I just figured it'd be hotter and there'd be better beaches. Um, you know, I, I've assumed there would be a really, really great and in, in incredible and supportive UX community, which there is, uh, you know, having been in, involved in the UX community in Canada for about six, seven years before I moved. Uh, you know, a lot of the, the good UX reports and awards come from the Australian sector. Uh, and there, there's really a lot of really great work that happens there. And lastly, I figured it would be a smooth transition. I would pack up my bags here in Canada, I would hop on a plane, I would land in Australia and everyone would just be dying to hire me and I would just, you know, get a really great opportunity and life is going to be incredible. 
And then it wasn't necessarily all that I thought it was going to be. So, you know, there were definitely spiders and snakes, but there were bushfires too. So that was something that I didn't plan for. And from a cultural perspective, it was really different from Canada, um, you know, and, you know, just the euphemisms and, and phrases that people use are different and, and just the personalities and the, and the ways of interacting with people was different. And so it was, it was a lot different from, from Canadian culture. Uh, and I certainly hadn't really planned on that. Um, and then when it comes to that incredible and supportive UX community, um, you, you know, in the larger cities, uh, Sydney, Melbourne, uh, both of those are, are large, very diverse and interesting cities uh, that have excellent UX communities. Uh, but I had settled down in, in Brisbane, which arguably has the best beaches and the best climate and a lot of things going for it, but doesn't necessarily have going for it is a really mature and, and diverse UX community. Um, I found it challenging to find um, other individuals who were uh, specialists like myself. It's a very um, kind of generalist population where their expectations of a UX designer is, is someone that can uh, you know, do everything from research through to information architecture, content strategy, interaction design, visual design, usability testing. And if you're really lucky, you'll also get someone who can be a developer on top of all of that. So lots of quests for the unicorns down there. Um, and I'm not a unicorn. So uh, that was a, a little bit of a challenge. <clears throat> and then it was just a challenging transition overall. You know, I, I had left behind an incredibly supportive personal and professional network in, in Canada. And I moved to a country where I knew five people the day I landed. Um, so, you know, it was certainly something I didn't plan for. And I, I hadn't been curious enough to, to really think about that before I got down there. So here comes in, you know, the curiosity side of things. Um, <clears throat> you know, I was, in, I was incredibly unfortunate, uh, sorry, incredibly fortunate that uh, in the first week of being in Australia, I attended a Ladies at UX event. Uh, in Brisbane <clears throat> and ended up meeting some absolutely incredible people, including the woman who would later become my boss at the University of Queensland. Uh, she was giving a, a talk on service design um, at the event. And, you know, I was kind of sitting there thinking, well, this is pretty <clears throat> introductory level. I, I don't know that there's really too much to be to be gained from this. You know, I've done a lot of service design. I, you know, I, I really understand the foundations. So it wasn't really, you know, what she talked about that, that brought value to me in, in that instance, but it was, you know, a lot about the, the networking and, and the, you know, introducing myself and saying hello and, and, and getting to meet people. So I, I met this woman who had, you know, given this talk. We, we chatted briefly at the event and then we went our separate ways. And then, you know, a couple of weeks later, she posted a job posting for an information architect, uh, which given the generalist nature of the Brisbane scene that I'd mentioned, was absolutely a godsend to me. Uh, you know, I applied for it, and, um, and and I was one of very few individuals in in the scene who specialized in information architecture. Um, and it turns out that in the entire year and a half that I was in Australia, that was the only role that ever got posted that was truly dedicated specifically to information architecture, rather than a UX generalist role. So. Uh, my timing on that, one, I think, was was pretty good, um, and I was very fortunate to to meet um, my boss at that event. Who, incidentally, one of the other women that I met at that event uh, was an interaction designer, um, and she ended up getting hired on the same team as me. And so we had a really great time spending a year and a half together working on some some really incredibly complex design challenges. So as I kind of talked a little bit about the, the work I did at UQ, um, you know. Uh, the University of Queensland is a, is a large university. It's one of the, the consistently top ranked universities in the world, uh, usually the top 50. Um, it's an incredibly diverse community um, and, and it, it's absolutely fascinating place to work. Um, you know, I led a lot of internal discovery work with the uh, internal stakeholders and users on the team. Um, and once again, I was, I was ill prepared for just how different the Australian post-secondary education sector was in comparison to the Canadian sector. You know, I'd completed two university degrees in Canada and a post-secondary uh, professional certificate at three different uh, post-secondary institutions in Canada. So I came into the role with a very clear idea in my head of, of what the environment was like and what work would need to be done to help enact this digital transformation that was kind of the pinpoint and the, the circle or the, the epicenter of the work I was doing. Um, 
you know, and it didn't end up really being at all like I thought it was going to be. Um, and this is where my, my curiosity really got reignited and, and re-sparked. Um, and really where the, where the beauty lies in the work that I did, I was able to actually leverage being the new girl in town, the, the new girl in the country, in fact, um, to really be able to dig deep within the university and, and ask some really hard questions, uh, challenging a lot of assumptions that, that most people I don't think would have gotten away with um, if they were local. Um, you know, because I was, I was new, I was able to kind of play that, you know, I'm new to this whole scene, help me understand, um, and, and kind of played up that a little bit to my advantage, um, you know, and, and I kind of played on this, this fascinating, this deep fascination that Australians have with Canadians. Um, so, you know, when, I, when it's asking some of those questions, I think a lot of Australians probably would have been dismissed for asking. Uh, I was fortunate that you know, they were fascinated by me and, and my Canadian experience. And so they just kind of forgave me for, for my ignorance and, and really helped me to make sense um, by, by being willing to kind of get deep into the weeds with me and, and kind of uncover those, those kind of weird anomalies that make Australia so different from Canada. Um, you know, and, and when you're in, in an ecosystem as complex as the University of Queensland was, um, being able to be unrelentingly curious um, and ask these kinds of questions is, is really critical. Um, you know, and then I was able to kind of make suggestions and recommendations based on this newcomer's perspective that probably would have actually been dismissed by, by kind of more of the local people on my team. Um, and so one of the things I think was the, the biggest advantage of all of this was that I had pretty lofty goals and visions for what the university's digital ecosystem could be. Uh, you know, they were coming from a pretty digitally immature place uh, and, and by coming in as, as the outsider with you know, kind of this weird fascination with Canadians, I was able to kind of build on that and, and show them the, this amazing idea of what could potentially be kind of their, their, their next destination in their ecosystem. Um, so that was, that was really kind of the, the perk of being an outsider, I think, through all of this. Um, you know, and, and just being able to build that, that, you know, diverse and eclectic network across the university um, by being curious and by being a bit of an outsider um, and kind of just needing to ask those questions to really understand other people's perspectives. Um, so, you know, I achieved more than I ever thought possible during my time at UQ. Um, I expanded my understanding of their ecosystem in, in, in which I worked. And I grew immensely as a UX practitioner, as a human, simply because I had to welcome that curiosity and I had to um, you know, acknowledge its necessity in, in my new situation. So um, you know, it's kind of a really whirlwind tour of, of my time in Australia and kind of the work I did um, and where curiosity came into play. Um, so you know, if you're starting to think that Australia you know, might be the place for you, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna say don't go, it's, it's an incredible, incredible place. Uh, I'd be happy to connect you with my network, give you the insider scoop on life down under and tell you the best beaches, the best restaurants. Um, you know, it's, it's a really great place to be. Um, but you know, if, if packing up your bags and moving halfway around the world isn't really on your radar and like, you know, the current situation is probably not, you know, you don't need to move halfway around the world to start exploring that curiosity. Uh, you don't even need to quit your job to do that. You know, there's a lot you can do in your current role to embrace that curiosity um, and, and just kind of remembering that, uh, you know, if it's just reaching out to someone in your department, your team that you don't know much about, you know, take them for coffee or lunch and spend 30 minutes kind of exploring them and their, their role in, the, in an organization and what their department is, is working on, any challenges that they see coming up. Uh, you know, follow up and continue to build these relationships. That's kind of, you know, the, the biggest way that, that curiosity got sparked for me in, in Australia was building those networks across the university. Um, you know, looking beyond that immediate to-do list and really understanding the organization as a whole that you're working in. Um, and then when it comes time to solve some of those really exciting and interesting problems that, that are going to come up, uh, you know, there will be people across the organization who say, oh, yeah. What about so and so? You know, I had coffee with with her. I had coffee with him the other day. You know, I, I think they'd be great. They're really curious. I think they'd be a really good fit for this role. Uh, you know, it's something as simple as asking your boss for a, a new project, something that gets you out of your day to day routine. Uh, you know, is there a new client, a new internal project that's kind of piqued your interest? Kind of show that initiative and ask your boss, hey, how can I get involved in that? 
Um, you know, and then there's a lot of things you can do in your own time. You know, take a course, read a book, listen to a TED talk, you know, attend events like this, World IA Day, uh, you know, volunteer for a local organization, you know, take that initiative on yourself and, and find things that you're curious about and start asking questions and start digging deeper and, and get involved. I think what matters is that you're continually learning new things, uh, you know, expanding your horizon, being open to, to new, new ideas and, and new concepts. And then just demonstrate that initiative for your own growth. So that's a lot of kind of what I learned in Australia, um, you know, kind of just being in, in control of your own career and figuring out how curiosity can, can get you to that next step in, in your career journey. So um, love for any of you to stay in touch with me. Uh, here's my, my contact information. I'll be kind of hanging around in the, the chat rooms throughout today. Um, and it was, it's been great kind of sharing my little bit of Australia with you. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for uh, uh, sharing us your travels and your journey. Uh, it's been really uh, cool to to hear some of that uh, firsthand, and and I'm glad that you're able to share some of that with us here today. Uh, we have time for one question, and there's some other ones in the. Uh, the chat and and they've uh, tagged you uh, with the uh, 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 in the in the chat. But um, um, one question from Carm is uh, oh, it just jumped up. How to uh, balance not asking too many questions if even if curious is um. you know, to ask the five W's and how. What's the good limit? <laughs> uh, I don't think there is such thing as too many questions. I think it's about just kind of gauging your audience. And, you know, if someone's clearly, you know, kind of trying to wrap up a conversation with you, you can politely have them on their way, but, you know, kind of leaving that door open to follow up and, and continue a conversation. Um, you know, I, I think it's our job to, to make sense of the world in which we live and to be able to kind of replicate that in, in whatever application we're designing, whether that's a digital interface or, a, you know, a more service-focused non-digital interface. So it, I think you need to keep asking the questions until you can really make sense of something. So I would encourage you, yeah, keep asking those questions and don't stop unless your audience clearly wants you to, but then <laughs> kind of circle back and, and try to regroup again. But there, I don't think there is such a thing as too many questions when, when that's our job is to ask. Mm -hmm.